So how do we know we with the Messiah? Because we are accomplishing with what the knowledge has been given to us. So when you and I are going through a struggle in life, when you and I are going through a struggle in life, we ain't looking for something external to address it. Bills are due. What do we do? We get on the ground and so I'm going to pray. I'm not saying don't pray, but we got to get up and work with that energy of the prayer to accomplish our task. And the problem oftentimes, brothers and sisters, we don't fully understand the damage that takes place when we believe in a mystery God. Because belief in a mystery God brings about a degree of this insecurity of self. But when I know God is a human being that has come to make me into himself, then now that increases the level of confidence that I have in myself to depend on myself. But I know that I'm not just of myself because I didn't make myself. So now I can depend on that force that's in me to accomplish the task that I need to accomplish so I can depend on Allah and myself. So now the question is, when you say Allahu Akbar, who are you giving credit to? There is no mystery God. It's like this phone that has 100% battery on it. Then if you use it and use it and use it and use it, eventually you're going to have to plug it up. So a Muslim is told to plug himself up at least a minimum of five times a day. So is the energy that's charging the phone that 100% battery, is it on the outside or is it on the inside? So when I'm plugging up my phone, the battery begins to go back to that 100%. So that energy and that force that when I'm down, it's not nothing external that's bringing me up. It's my connection with the force that's already in me is my connection to it that allows me to come up again and not giving credit to a spook God. We were out there pushing a day and a brother said, he said, man, thank y'all for coming out. I know, I got you. Thank y'all for coming out. And then he said, but my ch I challenge you. He held his Bible up. I mean, he said, with this Bible, I will challenge you. And in challenging you, my Christianity will overcome your Islam. And I was a just about to say something. <laughs> then he showed me he would throw it off because he said, because I control the birds. I say, see, he throw it off. I don't even have to say nothing. Because there is a connection between security and sanity. You can't live in an environment because the first law of nature is self-preservation. A Muslim is one who is being made secure. Ah, I hear you. That's my minister. <laughs> so, beloved brothers and sisters, the teaching of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is to close the gap between God, Allah, and ourselves. That's all I said all that to say that. Closing the gap between Allah and ourselves. 
And he came and he visited you and I. This is why when my beloved truth minister, wherever he goes, they know who he is and whose he is. So when he's talking politics, when he's talking politics, it's okay, I'm, I'm here. I know what you say. The reason I say that is, is because in life we can get easily distracted. We got to be able to look and, and confront and stay right in the moment so we can easily do this and then when you do that what did you just miss <laughs> let's stay focused because the enemy got ways of just taking us off just like that but when he know he can't move you because he can't move Farrakhan now he began to use all type of tricks and all this stuff but he still can't move him because he's with a God that sees and knows everything. So even though our brother, our brother, student minister, brother Dr. Abdul Halim Muhammad, and we out in the community, and just the love that the community has for the nation of Islam. Because we're not coming with democratic politics. We're not coming with so-called conservative politics. Right? We're coming with what the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has to say. And this is what moves human beings from one condition to another. So we thank Almighty God Allah for the work of our beloved student minister and what he's doing in his city and throughout the region. And may Allah continue to bless him and strengthen him as I bring him to the rostrum our beloved student minister, Brother Dr. Abdul Halim Muhammad, and let's receive him with a wonderful round of applause. as alaikum. alaykum. as alaykum. In the name of Allah, the beneficent and merciful, I bear witness there is no God but Allah. I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. I'm a student of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I can never thank Allah enough for his intervention in our affairs and the person of Master Fahd Muhammad, the great Makdi who traveled 9,000 miles to seek and to save that which was lost. And you can find all the people more fitting the description of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the prodigal son, the children of Israel, than the black man and the black woman of North America. We thank Allah for his demonstration of love for traveling 9,000 miles. I'm sure he wanted someone to come with him, but they didn't come, so he came by himself. And his right arm upheld him. And he came here, brothers and sisters, and he raised up one from a dead people, the first begotten of the dead. There is no Malcolm X without him. There is no Muhammad Ali without him. There is no Imam Wartha Dean Muhammad without him. The one I speak of is our leader, teacher, and guide, the eternal leader of the nation of Islam, the Messiah, the Messenger, the exalted Christ, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. Yes, we thank him for not leaving us alone, but Allah gifting him with a helper, a star without equal, a man with sublime morals, a man whose love transcends all fear, a man whose love is the creative force that brought a nation back from the dead. I do, I do love the scripture where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. That's good. But Farrakhan, the one I'm speaking of, raised a nation from the dead. And we thank Allah for that mighty one, our brother, our servant, and our friend. And I greet you once again in the green words of peace. As-salamu alaykum. Let's give Brother Eric and all our presenters a round of applause, please. I don't want to keep you long, just about five hours today. And I do want to uh, take up this subject. I, I want to get some things straight first so that you're not confused. Sometimes people get confused because we think we know. And we get stuck on that thing that we think we know. And we don't even wait to find out the explanation for what we think we know. 
but in truth we don't know. I, I took the subject denying the Messiah, the cock crows thrice, meaning three. In the scripture in the book of Mark, Jesus says that of says of um, to Peter that the cock would not crow twice before Peter would deny him thrice. Okay? But that's not my point. My point is not about how many times the crow cock uh, co uh, the crow, uh, the cock crows, the crow cocks. <laughs> That's a tongue twister right there. Not how many times the the cock crows, but it's really about what the cock represents and what this denial represents. This is what I want you to hone in on because the other scriptures. And I'm not here to point out the contradictions in the Bible, though I could make a whole month's worth of subjects of that. It's not to shake your faith, brothers and sisters. It is to give you truth instead of falsehood. But the other Gospels say that the cock would not crow until he denied him thrice. So it never gives a number. That's my point. Mark gives you a number, but the other Scriptures, Gospels don't give you a number. So you could stay, sit there all day and have one of those uh, barbershop debates, beauty shop debates all day long about something like that, and it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't amount to anything. So we picked this subject because, brothers and sisters, we're in a very, very dangerous time. And what happens, brothers and sisters, is after people eat, especially black people, we get what's called the itis. We get sleepy. And we fall asleep. And the scriptures of the Bible says is that while men slept, an enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. And when the disciples finally woke up, they wanted to go into the field and tear up the wheat, but it was too late. Because if you tear up the tares, tear up the tares, okay, pull up the tares, you'll wind up destroying the wheat because they look alike. So what has to happen is you have to wait till harvest time and then you have to separate the wheat from the tares and throw the tares into the fire. Is everybody all right? Just, just, just hang with me, brothers and sisters. If you be nice, I'll, I'll shorten my lecture to, to four hours and 55 minutes. So let me go right to the point that I want to make because the Honorable Elijah Palmer taught the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. He said, brother, just go right to the point of the subject and then you can fall asleep after that. Let me go to these three men. Why I said the cock crows thrice is because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad told the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan that what I've given you, brother, is a wake-up message. So that means that what he got from Master Fahd Muhammad through the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was just a wake-up message. Yes, but we fell asleep when Master Fahd Muhammad came. After he left. We fell asleep after the Honorable Elijah Muhammad departed. And right now, brothers and sisters, we got sleep in our eyes. Now that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is among us, denying the Messiah, the cock crows thrice. This cock, this rooster, when the sun is coming up, you hear him. If you've ever been out on a farm, and many of you are city slickers, so you've never been out on a farm, but if you've gone to the family reunion, to the country, you, you know you know I'm talking about the country. Would it be bugs and things like that? You go there to the country, and then there's somebody got a, a male chicken. He's strutting around. You hear that in the morning, man, somebody throw a rock. You hit him in his head. I'm trying to get some sleep. But he's calling. He's 
crowing at the rise of a new sun, at the dawn of a new day. And you want to keep sleeping, so you want to roll over. You don't want to hear it. So when someone comes with the truth that disturbs your peace of mind, settling in the falsehood of night, what the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said, Satan comes to you at night when it's dark. And he doesn't tell you the straight truth. He always interprets the truth. So in the darkness of our own mind, we're now beginning to interpret the truth in such a way it justifies the wickedness that we are now going back. In other words, the dog is returning back to his vomit. We're in a dangerous hour denying the Messiah. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that we believe that Allah God appeared in the person of W, Master W. Fahd Muhammad, July 1930, the long-awaited Messiah of the Christians and the Mahdi of the Muslims. Yes, Think about that. He taught that Master Fahd Muhammad was God in person. Yes, but those who learned with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad didn't see him like that. So when Master Fahd Muhammad departed from among us, those, including the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's own brother, That's right. his assistant minister, yes, turned on him, and he was on the run for seven long years. Yes, they were trying to kill him. Why? Because Master Fahd Muhammad had chose him to be his representative. Yes, so, if he teaches that the one that came and taught him is God, then he's making himself something, and the ones who came up with him said, you, Elijah, are trying to make yourself something that you're not. If he was God in person, then you must be the messenger instead of just the minister. There were those who thought that they preached better than Elijah. There were those who wanted to raise up the American flag and not the sun, moon, and stars that we've been given. Y'all not hearing me? So they wanted to kill Elijah. And for seven long years, he was on the run, brothers and sisters. The cock, the cock crowed once. Then Elijah Muhammad was arrested May the 8th, 1942, taken to jail, taken to prison, saying he was uh, evading the draft or didn't sign up for, uh, for the, the selective service, for the draft, but he was too old. Yes, they arrested him to get him off the street because he was teaching our people, don't go over there and fight for this man. He won't even give you human and civil rights here. What are you going over there fighting for a democracy that you don't even enjoy? So they needed our black bodies. What do they need them for? To go fight a war in segregated units. Yes, sir. Just like today, they don't really love you, but they need your black vote to put them back in office. You don't even got enough sense to lay an agenda before them and tell you, this is what we want and this is what we believe. If you want my vote, this is what you got to give me. I don't want to see no black face in a high place again. Secretary of nothing. Huh? So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad gets out of prison. He rebuilds the work of his teacher, Master Fahd Muhammad. The Nation of Islam hits his zenith in the early 70s. Then the Honorable Elijah Muhammad departs. In February 1975, the Nation of Islam leadership is turned over to his son, Wallace D. Muhammad, the Supreme Minister. And then he became Imam Wallace D. Muhammad. Then we went from being the Nation of Islam to being the World Community of Islam to being the Muslim American Mission to being all of these things. The Muhammad Speaks newspaper went to become the Bilalian News. That's right. 
Then the Muslim Journal, I'm not knocking any of that. I'm just telling you, giving you the history. And all that we held, the 46,000 acres of farmland that we had here and in Central and South America. Y'all all right? The metric tons of fish that we imported, we were the largest importers of frozen fish in the country. I didn't say black. Before there ever was a dollar store or dollar general or any of those, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had set up the Muslim import store. Come on now. We had our own supermarkets, our own trucking system, our own aviation system in Gary, Indiana. That's right. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad was negotiating to buy Midway Airport. Come on, come on. You're not hearing me. That's right. This is what he had for us, and all of that went away. Within six months, they took down his picture. That's right. That's right. The cock crowed twice. Now today, they thought Elijah Muhammad and the teachers were dead. Come on, man. Come on, man. And as he told his student, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, he told him, he said, brother, one day they'll say that that teaching was good for back then. And some of us treat it like that. It was good for back then. But that kind of black talk, that kind of talk that you're talking about, that independence, that separation talk was for yesterday. We're not into that today. We something else, somewhere else today. Oh, really? So God had to give you, Mr. Trump, To wake you up, he had to let you see what was always hidden underneath the surface. He had to peel back the onion. He had to take off the mask of civility to make you and I see that we have never been loved. We are not loved, and we will never be loved until we love God more than we love anything else and love ourselves. Then we don't have to be loved, we'll be respected. Come on, Keep it on that line. Be nice. I only keep you for four hours and fifty minutes. Come on, come on. But now today, today, brothers and sisters, we looked at the rise, the, the rebuilding of the nation of Islam, and at a certain point in time. We hit a zenith of popularity among our people. And the nation of Islam literally became almost like a fad. It was cool to be with the Muslims because it was the cool of the day. But now that the sun is up and it's getting hot, we see what we see. The cock is crowing for the third time. And if you and I don't wake up, remember, there's one unforgivable sin in the, whole, in, in the Bible. It is to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is not a spook. The Holy Spirit isn't even a spirit. The Holy Spirit is a man. In whom, in whom, in whom the Holy Spirit resides. Y'all all right? He's a comforter that comes, he is sent huh, by the Jesus figure to comfort the people. And he doesn't teach of himself. He teaches of the master that sent him. Now you have to bear witness that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan teaches Elijah. That's what he teaches. Now, my question is, brothers and sisters, is what is the greatest gift? The greatest gift, you may think, is divine revelation. No, go back, brother. The greatest gift, may you may think, is divine revelation. Yeah, it is, in one sense. But the greatest gift, 
is the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, that Holy Spirit will give you the ability to look into the divine revelation and be able to apply it. So, what we're going to show you now is what's called supreme wisdom. It's good, but do we have supreme understanding? The ability to apply what you and I think we're wise in. How does it apply? I don't need to interpret it because interpretation is left for the devil. What we want to do is apply it. Otherwise, what we're doing here is an exercise in vanity. Are we okay? Yes, sir. Lost found Muslim lesson number one. Question answer number three. Ask the question, why did we let half original man Columbus discover the poor part of the planet Earth? Now, the real thing I want you to do as you put on your seatbelt and your shoulder harness yes, sir. is don't, don't, don't just recite the question and the answer. The question is, why did we let half original man Columbus discover the poor part of the planet Earth? The real question is, why did Master Fahd Muhammad ask the Honorable Elijah Muhammad why? Why did he ask him why? What does it have to do with you and I to recite a history that we only recently, some of us still think Columbus discovered America? The answer is because the original man is the God and owner of the earth and knows every square inch of it and has chosen for himself the best part. He did not care about the poor part. Columbus was a half original man and was born in Italy, which is Southeast Europe. His full name was Christopher Columbus and the place he discovered was North America. He found the Indians here who were exiled 16,000 years ago from India. They are original people. So my question is, next, why those of us who are registered in the Nation of Islam to enroll in this class to get registered to become Muslim, registered Muslim in the Nation of Islam, why do we have to answer these 10 questions with 10 answers? Student enrollment question <coughs> answer number three. What is the population of the original nation in the wilderness of North America and all over the planet Earth? The answer is the population of the original nation in the wilderness of North America is, at that time, 17 million. With the 2 million Indians makes it what? 19 million. And all over the planet Earth was 4 billion, 400 million. Y'all all right? Yes, now, the next question we're asking number four is, what is the population of the colored people in the wilderness of North America and all over the planet Earth? That answer is 103 million. All over the planet Earth is 400 million. No, brother, don't just stay where I put you now. <laughs> but what was he trying to get us to see? If you look at it, we think we're a minority. Come on, man. Come on. But what he was doing was showing us that we're not a minority. Amen. That in fact, all over the planet Earth, there's four billion four hundred million of us. Yes, in America it was 17 million plus the 2 million Indians giving us 19 million. Yes, 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 that's true. And yes, in America at that time was 103 million of them. And all over the planet was 400 million of them. But when you look at it in its totality, 4 billion, 400 million means that over 400 million means that we've got them outnumbered 11 to 1. So there's an old proverb that I learned that when they draw a circle to keep you out, you draw a bigger circle to keep them in. But going back to Columbus, and let's go to the next. Now, brother, the truth about Thanksgiving. I want to make sure, I want to make sure that, that, that our native brothers and sisters and our Latino brothers and sisters who really aren't Spanish, got to stop that. You're not Spanish. You just speak Spanish. Our Brazilian brothers and sisters, you're really not Portuguese. You just speak Portuguese. 
are Haitian, brothers and sisters, you really aren't Creole or French. You just speak French. Are we okay? And those of y'all who are in the Dutch Antilles and all that, you ain't Dutch. You just speak them languages. Y'all get what I'm saying? Now, when it comes to Thanksgiving, I mean Thanksgiving, the Mayflower landed at Plymouth, Massachusetts, leaving from Plymouth, England in 1620. In 1621, the three-day celebration for the successful harvest took place. About 90 members of the Wampanoag, which means Easterners or, dawn, or people of the dawn. I thought that was interesting. Their tribe attended, but there was no evidence that they were ever really invited. The event wasn't called the first Thanksgiving by the New Englanders until 1830. Pilgrims never called themselves pilgrims, seeking religious freedom. They were separatists coming to establish a religious theocracy. The term pilgrim surfaces around 1880. Y'all all right? Now, I know that you're waiting for Thanksgiving, but there was no turkey or pie served during Thanksgiving. I know you want your sweet potato pie, your yam, candy yams and all that, but there was no sweet potatoes in America at that time. At that time, they served venison or deer, which the Indian brought to them, and the, and the pilgrims served vegetables. In 1789, President George Washington designated November 26th of that year as a day of thanksgiving for the nation under its new federal constitution. Lincoln made it an official holiday in 1863 after the Civil War victories in Vicksburg, Mississippi, and Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Now let's go to the next. Why, why do the Native Americans call this a day of mourning? I, I know y'all love history, don't you? I know you love history. I, 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 you have to take the lessons and apply them. You have to parse them. You have to break them apart. You have to see what's in them. There's so much in them. We don't need a new teaching per se. We need to get into what we already have, man, and dig, 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 brothers and sisters. You'll find out you, there's no bottom to them. None. Relations between the Wampagnog and the settlers deteriorated, leading to the Pequot War. In 1637, in retaliation for the murder of a man the settlers believed the, Wamp the Wampagnogs killed, they burned the, a nearby village, killing as many as 500 men, women, and children. Following the massacre, William Bradford, the governor of Plymouth, wrote that for the next 100 years, every Thanksgiving day ordained by a governor was in honor of the bloody victory, thanking God that the battle had been won. So for them, in some of their minds, Thanksgiving is about the massacre of the native people. That they wiped out with their guns. They wiped out with their diseases. They wiped out with their fire water. They wiped out by setting one tribe against another. They, they wiped out by lying to them and making promises. There probably isn't one treaty that the white man has made with the native that he's ever kept. That's right. That's right. No, not one. What does the Honorable Elijah Muhammad say about all of these holidays? In talking about food, because I know we think about Thursday, we think, oh, Lord, some of the sisters that think about Wednesday, Lord, what I got to do? I gotta, man, I got to make the macaroni and cheese. I got I to gotta make the cabbage. Lord, I'm making, what they expect me to bring the rolls and the biscuits? And I got to bring the drink. I got to bring this. I got to bring that. You know, or or we're going, we going to Big Mama's house. I ain't bring nothing but my appetite. But. Watch on Wednesday night if you go there to get a little egg. Now, you know, you know how we, come on now. Stop it. Stop it. I don't care how many, I don't care how long your headpiece is and your, how long your bow tie is. You know, doggone well, something going to happen over this weekend. Talk to me. And I'm not discouraging you. 
from going and visiting your relatives. All I'm trying to do is teach you the truth of why you are gathering on that day. And if you're going to gather on that day, do it out of love for family to be with them and love them. And when they ask you why you won't eat the ham, teach hard. In this book called How to Eat to Live, and on the top of it says, from God in person, Master Fahd Muhammad. <laughs> He's given you an eye, a diet that, as the scriptures say, will give you life and life more abundantly. I was with a, a, a very um, high-profile uh, political official, and we were in a meeting, and this person came in with a whole tray of pork rinds and said, I'm hungry. And if I had a pig here, I'd eat it from the, from, the, from the tail to the front. I'd eat the whole hog. I loved the hog. And I just looked at them as they were eating, and, and I gave them a napkin because I didn't want them licking their fingers and then shaking my hand. I'll give you a little dap. Okay. I'm going to give you a little hug. Give you a little dap. A little dap. But as we were leaving, I said, you know, I'm going to give you a couple of books called How to Eat to Live. I said, and then I began because there were a bunch of, um, how you call them, cubicles. So I started to say, you know, I started talking loud. <laughs> you know, you remind me of a person that got lung cancer and keeps smoking cigarettes. Why did I say that? Because the person said to me, you know, I take three pills. I got high blood pressure and all that. I said, well, see, you need to get off that hog and get on how to eat to live. I mean, you don't have to be sick. You don't have to cut your life short. And, and the Muslim diet just isn't we just don't eat pork. We just don't consume filth. in any of its form. But now, why do they sell so much hog? Particularly in our stores, but when you see the new HEB open up there on uh, 288, look and see the kind of groceries you have there versus the kind you have right now. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says in How to Eat to Live, book two, the world that we are now living in, as I have repeatedly written, in this article is a commercial world which commercializes on everything on which they can make an extra dollar. So they don't care whether it's Groundhog Day, Arbor Day, Veterans Day, Labor Day, St. Patrick's Day, Valentine's Day, President's Day, Martin Luther King Day, Black Friday, the, any day you name, 4th of July, 4th of July, it don't matter. Memorial Day, all of them days, New Year's Day, there's always behind it is sale. I mean, if you keep taking 20% off during all that time, then I should get it for free. If all these sales got 25% off. Come right, come right now. Mattress giant. Come on. 50% off. Okay. And then the next month, the next holiday, it's another 50% off. By the time it, it, I, they should be paying me to come get the stuff. Right. Y'all right. 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 okay? <laughs> All right, let me try to move so that I only keep you for four hours today. The Christian holidays, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad writes in our Savior's Ride, my dear black brothers and black sisters, the religion Christian holidays that you celebrate are holidays for white people, not for black people. The white people do not worship any day belonging to black people, why should you worship their days? Days which are in their interest and not in the interest of the black man. Next. On the 25th day of December comes another Christian holiday that they say is observed in remembrance of Jesus. Some say it is to keep the in the remembrance of his birth date. The late writers 
on the word Christmas seem to be ashamed to go along with the old writers that the 25th day of December was the birthday of Jesus because there has been so much research on whether or not Jesus was even born in December. Come on, man. Next. The merchants' pockets are made fat for Christmas. The tobacco factories, the beer and whiskey traffic and wine. These things, beer, wine, whiskey, find a great sale at Christmas time. Also, much wild game is bought, and the fattest pig that their farmers can produce is bought. All of these things, especially intoxicating liquors and eating of swine flesh and drunkenness, dancing and gambling, are done on the day that they commemorate for a man that they claim to have been the, a most perfect man, holy, righteous, the Son of God. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad goes on to say, but since it is a Christian holiday, they are not particular whether, uh, particular whether or not Jesus or the Roman Caesar was born on that day. For the real good of holidays by the Christians is to commercialize on the public. They sell much merchandise on, of various kinds, even now to automobiles, maybe airplanes and boats. Suits of clothes are some of the main items of merchandise that are sold plentiful around Christmas. Shoes, new pieces of furniture in the home, and other home decorations. Next, there is no holy worship on that day for him. The government of Christianity throws open the freedom of worshiping at that time, Christmas, to both savages, clergymen, and Christian sages, the wise, to disgrace the prophet of God, whom they themselves exalt to the point of being God himself. Now, let me help you better understand about this December or December 25th. Let me give you the true history of Jesus in a bean shell. One, he was not born without agency of a man. He was the son of Mary and Joseph. It's all right. It doesn't, doesn't take away from him because he had brothers and sisters. And Mary only had one son, and that was Jesus. That really wasn't even his name, but I'm not here to argue all of that, that kind of logist, uh, uh, linguistics and all that. There's no J. So anyway, he was born in Palestine in September or October. He grew up in Egypt. He preached in Jerusalem. He was the last prophet to the Jews. He never taught multitudes. He lived to be 36 years old. He was murdered, not crucified. His body was taken and embalmed to last 10,000 years and hidden. That's, that's, that's the historical Jesus. There was a man named Jesus. But he was 2,000 years too early. This is why you find in the scriptures, particularly in the book of Isaiah, the most predictions of the Messiah are in the book of Isaiah. But if you look at it very carefully, you have to be able to distinguish and, deter and discern between the first coming and the second coming. If he was on time, he would have came in that time and done it both. But you find that now there's the first coming, and now they say the second coming, and we've been waiting 2,000 years. That is because six days shall he work, and on that seventh day shall be the Lord's day, which is the Sabbath day, which is the 7,000th year. Yes, sir. Jesus was 2,000 years too early. But he died for the truth that he spoke. Yeah, come on, man. And that's why his name lives forever. Y'all okay? Yeah. So who was born on December 25th? Nimrod. Nimrod. I'm just going to give it to you. Stop lying to your children. Please, don't do that. Do not tell your children that some fat Caucasian comes down your chimney and you live in an apartment and don't even have a chimney. You got this paper, you got this paper chimney taped up on your wall. And you say Santa Claus is coming down there, baby, and you put all and it's really you to buy going broke buying all them toys. Think about it. You tell them that on the roof, did you hear the noise, baby? on the roof. That was Santa Claus and his reindeer. No, Negro. That was the cat. The neighbor's cat running around. 
or a rat or a raccoon. Brother Roy. Rats running through your attic and whatnot, talking about that. That's the reindeer. There's no daggone reindeer. Y'all got to get mad Santa Claus stringing up about, about 18 rats. <laughs> Come on with that big screen. Come on. <laughs> so you, you tell your children that some elves in the North Pole made these toys for them. When it's you. Then you're going to whoop your children for telling them, don't you ever lie to me. How do you do that? How do you do that? How do you do that? Two fair, all that. And then you're going to whoop your child, or as my grandmother did, wash my mouth out with brown soap for lying. She whooped, and then she whooped me for lying, and then whooped me for what I did. And wash my mouth out with brown soap. Man, a DPS would have came and picked me up. Because I had whelps on my butt and brown soap all up in the corners of my mouth. <laughs> I'm just telling you. So look, Nimrod was the leader born as an opponent of Moses' teachings. This man was born in the last 300 years of Moses' 2,000 years. The whole scope of independent teaching of Moses is 1,700 years and not 2,000 years. Because of this, Nimrod breaks the 2,000 years by 300. Yes, Nimrod was an evil devil man, and according to the sketches of his history, nothing good is said about him. He was an opposer of Moses' law and order given to him from Allah God to guide Israel into independency of the original nation of the earth coming out of our Savior's arrival. So December 25th is Nimrod's birthday. It is the winter solstice. It is the winter Saturnalia, brothers and sisters. It is the shortest day of the year. And then it begins, as the sun begins now, its journey back, or the earth begins its journey back, and the days begin to lengthen. All right? They celebrate that as the sun being born, S-U-N being born. Tammuz, the son of Nimrod being born. You got to understand this, sister and brother. It ain't got nothing to do with Jesus. They had different dates that Jesus was born. But never was it December 25th. That was the enemy amalgamating Christianity with their pagan, instead of giving up paganism, they just put it all together. And that's what we're worshiping. Y'all all right? Let's go. Let's, let's see. Let's see if we can prove what we got to say. Jesus was crucified in the springtime of Passover, either April or March. That right there should make you wonder. If a man was killed on a certain day, rose from the dead three days later, that month shouldn't change. It is what it is. I've never seen anybody with a funeral program that, uh, that it says sunrise and then sunset, and, that sun, and then next time you come back, that sunset changes. When I look on it, I go to the gravestone, it'll say 1956 to 1969. I don't come back and see it crossed out and say, okay, well, maybe it was 1970. It is what it is. His ministry lasted three years, six months. It began when he was 30 years old in Luke 3, the 23rd chapter as required to become an official minister according to the book of Numbers 4 and 3. Now, if you count backwards from his birth, not December, but from October, and go three years, six months, you're in April or March. So he was born in October or September. Why? Because they wanted to know when he was born because the enemy, the wicked enemy, wanted to kill him. They knew that one was coming. They've always been looking for that one because they know that a Messiah will always come from the people who are oppressed. They always know this. The wicked know this. But Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem to be taxed 
according to Luke, the second chapter, one through five. The time of taxing would have been at the end of the harvest in fall. No record of taxes in the middle of winter was ever collected. The Feast of the Tabernacles in Jerusalem, according to Luke, the second chapter, 41st verse, the population swelled from 120,000 to over 2 million. And it says in Luke, the second chapter, the seventh verse, there was no room in the inn. That's why. It was the Super Bowl. It was an offshore technology conference. There was no hotel rooms, no rental cars. There was nothing. So they couldn't stay there. So in Bethlehem, uh, which was only five miles away, is north of Jerusalem. That's why he was born in Bethlehem, so they say. Next. What is it really about, brother and sister? My challenge to you and I is this. Whatever they want, I don't want. And whatever they don't want, I'm going to look into it. I didn't say I'm going to do it. I'm going to look into it. But this is what it's all about. It's about that money. Let, let's, let's, let's look at it. Come on. Let's go to the next one. So, holiday retail sales in the United States from 2000 to 2016 in billions of U.S. dollars. The statistic depicts holiday retail sales in the United States from 2000 to 2016 in 2015, holiday retail sales in the United States amounted to $632 billion U.S. dollars. The holiday season can account for as much as 30% of a retailer's annual sales. So why do you think they call it Black Friday? Because if your company goes in the negative or loses money, it's called going in the and if you end with the year end with a profit, it means you're in the black. So therefore, my brothers and sisters, it's called Black Friday. Because right. they make their money from December, from, from Thanksgiving to the end of December. Man, they stacking their chips. Right. Because you and I are going to be block, knocking each other out on Black Friday, trampling one another, and beating one another to death. Listen to what I'm saying. Come on, next. Let's move. Black Friday by the numbers. How many people shop in the store and online over the Thanksgiving weekend? See how it's going up, up, up to 2017? According to a survey by the National Retail Federation, 174 million U.S. consumers went shopping online or in store last year over Thanksgiving weekend, which spans Thanksgiving Day through Cyber Monday. That's about 70% of adults in the U.S., 66 million people shopped on Friday alone. And while the number of people choosing to do their shopping from their phones reached record highs last year, Walmart is still trying to hide, lure in foot tra traffic by giving away millions of free cookies and coffee. <laughs> Next. Black Friday by the numbers. How many people shop on Black Friday is not the question now. How many people, how much do people spend on Black Friday? <laughs> Last year, American shoppers spent a record $5 billion online in the space of 24 hours. U.S. retailers generated $7.9 billion in online sales from both Thanksgiving and Black Friday in 2017, which was up 17.9% from the year before, according to the research by Adobe Analytics. The holiday season, which runs from November to December, listen to this, is set to be even bigger than last year. Consumer surveyed by the NRF and the Prosper Insights and Analytics said that they would spend an average of $1,007.24 during the holiday season in 2018, which is up 4.1% from what they said they would spend in 2017. Collectively, U.S. consumers are expected to spend in excess of $1 trillion from November to December. How many people have died on Black Friday? Come on, man. According to the website Black Friday Death Count, there have so far been 10 deaths and 111, uh, 111 injuries on Black Friday in the U.S. This includes the death of a Walmart worker during a stampede in 2013 and a shooting in New Jersey in 2016. We all right? Yes, so, brothers and sisters, 
Dr. Martin Luther King, in his last speech before he was assassinated, said that we got to redistribute the pain. That's right. That's right. Why are you shop with people that don't respect you? Now, sister, I challenge you to walk in Needless Markup or uh, Neiman Marcus and walk in there with a, a kind of a big purse. You won't get five steps inside of the store before Heather will come up to you and say, ma'am, can I help you? Did you find what you were looking for? You said, no, I just got in here. <laughs> You'd be wanting to call all out her name or not. What you mean, can I help me? Or you feel somebody following you around, right. watching you. You know it and I know it. But why do we shop with people that don't respect us? People who, who give money, you say you want to get rid of Donald Trump. But yet the, the, the Waltons for Walmart and all these other places is giving money to him. Home Depot man, giving money to him. These people are giving big money to the people who are taking away whatever civil rights you think you have. Why do you give my, it's like you're going to feed a dog to keep biting you. One thing I can tell you is, is that money is their God. You withhold your money, you playing with their God. Y'all okay? All right. Now. Let's go, and I'm going to try to finish this in, in the next three hours. Why the cock crows thrice? I think I hit this before. Master Fahd Muhammad came with a teaching, raised up 25,000. We turned on who he left in charge. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad raised a nation within a nation. We turned on him. Now we have the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And today, brothers and sisters, we got to search our soul. Yes, sir. Why we don't have the same zeal, some of us, that we used to have. And what excuses that we use to stay at home when we should be out after our people. Let me say this, brothers and sisters. The thing about Peter, the thing about Peter, Peter was fishing. The early symbol of the Christians was never the cross. It was a fish. Y'all all right? Why? Because when he saw Peter, Peter was a fisherman. And he went to Peter and said, come follow me. I'll make you a fisher of men. So if the business or the work of the Christ or the Messiah is to fish men. See, there's all kind of fish, Mr. Farrakhan. He says, all kind of fish in the sea, swimming in the sea of sin. But we don't want all kind of fish and scavengers. He wants men. Men and women, but men. So to the extent that we are not fishing is the extent that we're not with the Messiah. When we stop fishing, we stop being with him because that's what he came to make us fishers of men. Our business is the resurrection of the dead. That's our business. Y'all all right? Don't get mama. I'm going I'm to make, I'll, I'll make you happy again. But I got to point it out. In John, the first, uh, the first chapter, the 19th verse. Now look, why do I say the, the cock crows thrice? See? I don't think I'm mixed up. I knew what I would, what I put on the paper, what I put on the flyer, because I had something else in mind. Not how many times the cock crowed that he would deny him, but how many times we would deny him in a wake-up message. Yes, so now, why do I point out these three? Because in John, the first chapter, the 19th through the 22nd verse, I'm using the New International Version. John the Baptist is out in the wilderness preaching and baptizing. And so the Jews sent their people to investigate. And it said in the New International Version, 
19th verse. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. They didn't know who he was. They just seen him doing the work. They, they wondered who he was, right? 20th verse. He did not fail to confess, but confess freely, I am not the Messiah. Then they asked him again, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Then they asked him a third time, are you the prophet? He answered, no. So why do I point out these three men? Master Bob Muhammad, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, because they're looking for three different men. Uh, some of you still ain't with that. You say, Negro, where'd you get that from? As my brother, as my brother Dr. Collin would say, where can I go read it where white folk wrote it? Now, let's go. Next. It's a wake-up message. This is a wake-up message. And when you wake up, you look in the mirror, Mr. Farrakhan say, even though you might not have had a rough sleep, but it looked like we've been in a fight. Hair be all over the place. Duck butter be in your eye. Call it sleep. Slob. You got that? You need that? That slob cut look like you've been chewing tobacco or something. You, 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 your breath be stinking. Just be look bad. You go first thing you do. You look in the mirror. Ooh. You wash your face, y'all. Cause once you wake up, you gotta clean up. Right. Y'all ain't mad at me, eh? Let's go. Let's go. Brothers and sisters, I'm deeply concerned over my 30 years over our children and how many of our children have been lost to the world. I'm talking specifically a Muslim, but our people in general. What has happened? Now, the scriptures say in Hosea, the fourth chapter, the sixth verse, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And usually you, you and I stop there. And, and we make it because we don't know anything. That's why we're destroyed. But it has a whole different context because there's no period or comma. <coughs> we okay? He said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. See, this crow, this, this cock has crowed three times. And our people have rejected it three times. And because we've rejected it, God says, I will reject thee. See, brother and sister, the hedge is about to come down. Minister Farrakhan is the hedge. It's about to come down, and these people are going to be let loose on us in a way that's going to frighten you like you've never seen before. We okay? He says, I will also reject thee that thou shalt be no priest to me. Now that's a special class of people within the children of Israel. There was a tribe called the Levites and within them was Aaron's priesthood. You see, brothers and sisters, those of us who are in the mosque, Understand that the mosque is not the nation of Islam, and the nation of Islam is not the mosque. The mosque is from the is the core of consciousness. So all you woke folk, we the alarm clock. We are the alarm clock. We are the conscious in the conscious community. Because you can't out black the Muslim. You can't out black us. Try as you will, you can't out-black us. Throw any stone you want to, because we're not afraid of anybody's knowledge, because when you teach that we're the original man, no matter who we go to or study or take from, remember, all of it comes from the original man. We're the father of it all. So if we go and reclaim what is ours, what do you got to say about it? We Okay. It says that thou shalt be no priest to me. Brothers and sisters, we're losing our shine. We're losing our edge. And if you talk with some of us and listen to our language, 
we're absolutely not talking the way we used to talk. We put down the books. We're not reading the way we, we're not riding with the minister or the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in the car like we used to. We remember when we used to send each other or we would go. The minister's going to be speaking in St. Louis. A crew of us will go to St. Louis. Then the minister's going to be teaching in Los Angeles. Well, I can't make that trip, but a crew of us will go to Los Angeles. Then he's teaching in Denver, so a crew of us will go to Denver. Then he's going to be in New Orleans. A crew of us will go to New Orleans. We wouldn't all go to all the same places, but many of us would go. And what was the first thing we always asked when the people returned? You got the tape? You got the tape? What happened when Brother Jabril would FedEx the study guys to us? And, and the secretary didn't have enough copies. We'd be looking at him like, what, man, what, what's up with that? Where's that zeal? You have to ask yourself the question. It ain't got nothing to do with me or anybody in front of you or the person sitting next to you. It got to do with you looking in the mirror and figuring out what happened to you. Because Satan interprets. You know the truth, but you know, sooner than you walk out the door, you'll be interpreting in your mind what I said. What I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you need to do self-examination self-analysis and self-correction. This ain't going to come from outside of yourself. It got to come from here. Yes, sir. We okay? Yes, so, if you want to be a priest to God, then look at what he says. This is, this is what we're going to have to bear on our shoulders when we think about our children. They're responsible now for the decision that they make. Once they reach a certain age, they got to decide for themselves. And they are responsible for what they decide to do. Some of that bears on us because they see us when we're not here. So my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. We can't teach one law for our sons and then our daughters, we're going to have them on lockdown. Our, our sons can't have girlfriends and our daughters can't have boyfriends. That's true, they can't have neither, but sometimes we lean it all like that. It can't be one thing for one and not for another. It's freedom, justice, and equality for yes, all. Sir. Does that make sense? Huh? Oh, I done stepped in your toe. Now you ain't, and nobody going, <laughs> and nobody happy with me good. Everybody being, you're not mad at me. Ain't nobody mad but the devil. So now we say, I, I, I give my life for the nation. I give my life for the minister, but we won't give our time. I'm going to stay right there. If I'm stepping on your toes, just move your feet. So Peter said unto him, Lord. Now think about Peter. Peter is not a person per se. Peter is a mindset. The chief disciple who in one instance recognized Jesus as being the Christ, the son of the living God. And then seven verses later, Jesus had to say, get thee behind me, Satan. How, is it, how did he go from praising him and seeing him as the son of God to rebuking him for telling him what his destiny was? And what is it about Peter seeing Jesus with all these miracles, hearing him teach, be with the master in the most intimate of settings? yet would deny him. See? Think about that. So, Jesus talking about 
his rendezvous with destiny. For Peter said to the Lord, why can I not follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. <laughs> and Jesus looked at him and answered him, Wilt thou lie down with thy life for my sake? Verily, verily. See, he got with them two verilies. He, when Jesus hits you with them two verilies, you in trouble. He, he's driving a point in. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Some people who think they are the real followers or the true followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Come on, man. But if they were walking with Master Prophet Muhammad, they would accuse Elijah Muhammad of teaching innovation, which is deviation. And now they walking, they try to walk a few steps with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Now they accuse him of teaching innovation, which is deviation. So in denying Minister Farrakhan, you denying all three of them. That's, right. That's my argument. That is my argument. So when Minister Farrakhan said he wasn't going to come back to Texas, some of you, when I tell you that, you say, oh, we're all alone. You out your mind. If you believe three are backing us, if you believe. That's right. If you don't, ain't nobody backing us, and we're in a heap of trouble. Think about that. I'm no way scared. It is what it is. Master Father Muhammad gave the Honorable Elijah Muhammad a holy Quran and a picture or a map of Texas. So I don't know what our destiny is, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm in for the ride. How about you? All oh, praise is due to Allah. Now, 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 Muhammad, go back to that point. Let's go to the next one. Let's go back to that point about three different men. Are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? No. Are you Elijah that was to come before the Messiah? No. Are you that prophet? They're they, they looking for three different, they trying to identify three. What jacket you wearing, bro? So, you know, as Brother Kyle was saying, where can I go read it? Well, white folk wrote it. The Wycliffe Bible Commentary. Now, according to the Christians, they say, it is written by 48 leading Bible scholars. This powerful handbook walks you through the entire text of the Old and New Testaments, primarily in the King James Version. <coughs> and according to Wycliffe, it says this on page 1074. This is where white folk wrote it. The Jews, as usual in John, this means leaders of the nation, these priests were of the Pharisees. Two things prompted the deputation, the strong preaching of John and his baptizing activity. They were wondering if he could be the promised Christ, according to Luke, the third chapter, the 15th verse. Elijah was expected before the coming of the Messiah, according to Malachi, the fourth chapter, the fifth verse. By that prophet, we were probably to understand the prophet of Deuteronomy 18, 15, and 18. By some, he was taken to be distinct from the Messiah. See John, the seventh chapter, the 40th verse. So, brothers and sisters, they're looking for three. They know that somebody was coming. They didn't know which one. They couldn't put their finger quite on what John the Baptist back then was doing. But now, don't go back 2,000 years. Look right now. They know that Master Father Muhammad was coming, but he came in sinful flesh to condense him in the flesh. He slipped right past them. And he came, and he's and he came like a thief in the night, meaning in the nighttime of the Great Depression of America, he slips in and he raises up one, the first begotten of the dead, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, and here is a man with third grade education, teaching wisdom that confounds the scholars even to this day. 
who do you know with a third grade education could teach a Malcolm Little with an eighth grade education and make Malcolm X, El Haj Malik Shabazz, to rock this country from one end to another, and he never finished his process? Who do you know with a third grade education could take a Cassius Marcellus Clay Jr. with a high school education and make him the great, name him the great Muhammad Ali, and he confound the scholars with a high school education? And who could take a Lewis Walcott, give him an X, then name him Farrakhan with only a two-year college education, third-year, three-year college education, and nobody could handle him. Nobody. I'm not just talking. Nobody could handle him. They put their best on him. So now they just stand back and throw rocks and call names. They can't handle him. And guess what? Mr. Farrakhan said he's not the only star. He said he got stars all in the nation of Islam. And they can't handle us neither. And they can't handle you if you get studied up. Prayed up, fired up, cleaned up, stand up, straighten up. Can't nobody handle you either. Come on. So let's wrap this up. Go to the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran says, and when the angel said, Oh Mary, surely Allah gives thee good news with a word from him of one whose name is the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, worthy of regard in this world and the hereafter and of those who are drawn nigh to Allah. And he will speak to the people when in the cradle and when of old age, and he will be one of the good ones. She said, My Lord, how can I have a son and man has not yet touched me? He said, Even so, Allah creates what he pleases. When he decrees a matter, he says to it, Be only, he says, only says to it, be, and it is. And he will teach him the book and the wisdom and the Torah and the gospel. Next. And make him a messenger to the children of Israel, saying, I've come to you with a sign from your Lord that I determine for you out of the dust the form of a bird. Then I breathe into it, and it becomes a bird with Allah's permission, and I heal the blind and the leprous and bring the dead to life with Allah's permission. I inform you of what you should eat and what you should store in your houses. Surely there is a sign in this for you if you are believers. And I am the verifier of that which is before me in the Torah, and I will allow you part of that which was forbidden to you, and I have come to you with a sign from your Lord to keep your duty to Allah and obey me. Next. So what should we look for, brothers and sisters? If we're looking for Jesus, if we're looking for Messiah in our midst, we should look for somebody who was taught the book, the wisdom, the Torah, and the gospel. Somebody that can go in and out of these books. And no matter where they are, they're teaching great wisdom. Sometimes we, we, we don't understand. Why is Farrakhan in the church preaching about Jesus? Because he knows who Christ is. He knows Jesus. Because he's walking in his footsteps right now. Right. Are y'all all right? Yes, Hell, he has stumbled upon his own identity. And if you keep following him, you'll stumble up on yours. He was speaking a cradle and of old age. When Farrakhan was 12 years in the rebuilding of the nation of Islam, he went to Mecca and he took on the scholars of Islam. He didn't teach Anything but what he was taught by his teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Right. And you found Jesus teaching in the temple at 12 years old. The lessons, the supreme wisdom lessons that I showed you is Elijah Muhammad answering questions from his teachers within the three years, four months that he was taught by him. He was a baby then. Minister Farrakhan will be 87 years old in, uh, uh, in May. And he's still teaching. In what you and I would consider old age, but he's really still a baby. Y'all all right? He, he found some dust, what was left of the nation of Islam. He didn't have nobody. It was just him, Brother Jabril, his family, <laughs> and Brother Wahid. Y'all all right? Come on, stick with me, y'all. Come on now. 
He breathed into this dust-like nation of Islam, and guess what? It began flying again. It became a bird soaring above this world. Look at it. Farrakhan kind of raised the nation from the day. I mean, I can't get over that. No, really, when I think about it. He's raised a man from the day. Okay, but Farrakhan kind of raised a whole nation. They thought was they killed it. They put a stake in it. They thought they they man, they put nails in the coffin. They did everything. Man, threw rocks on top of everything. And then all of a sudden, here the nation is back. How, how you do that? Against the wishes of the political powers, against the wishes of the religious powers, whether it's Muslim, Christian, or Jew, they were against what we were doing. Huh? He teaches you, brought back how to eat to live. Come on now, think about that. He verifies what's in the Old Testament because we're the fulfillment of it. We are the children of Israel. That's what got him in trouble with the Jews. Is that he said, no, we're the real chosen people of God, not you. You were never in Egypt in bondage for 400 years. There's no historical record of that, but we've been in bondage here for 400 years. So we're the real children of Israel. But the people lost their mind. If we're the real children of Israel, then who are they? Y'all all right? He comes with a sign, brothers and sisters. We are the sign. We are the sign in and of itself. There's no greater sign. As I tried to say, I kind of mingled it last week. Mr. Farrakhan said, it is easier to create the sun than to raise the dead. Come on, man. It's easier to create creatures, lions and tigers and bears, oh my, than it is to raise the dead. Come on, man. You and I were dead. He raised us from the dead. The sun obeys the God. The creatures obey the God. Only man can, uh, can decide whether he wants to obey God or not obey God. Only man can do that. But here we got a nation obedient to God in the midst of unbelief. Come on, man. Come on. If that's not a sign of the resurrection, then I don't know what is. Because ain't nobody going now. You can go down to Cullen, down to the graveyard, paradise, garden, whatever you want to call it, all out there in Acres Home. Ain't nobody getting up out of them graves. Yeah. Nobody. <laughs> Who was Jesus' enemies? The religious leaders of the time. The media, the scribes, the writers, the merchants and money changers. If black people stayed home on Black Friday, if you kept your money in your pocket till New Year's, and decide to shop after New Year's when they're trying to get rid of all their inventory. You know how well you'd make out, how much money you would save? But you know what? They'd go crazy. So they hate Farrakhan for telling you a people don't even believe in Jesus. Don't shop with people who don't believe in Jesus because at the end of the day, those people do not believe in Jesus, but on December 31st, they'll look at all the chips that they've stacked and they'll say, thank God for Jesus. And thank God them people believe this Jesus was born there because we got all their money and you in debt, paying it off till November, and then you're going to run that credit card back up again for what? Well, y'all got quiet. I'm wrong. <laughs> so look in these five books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. They're the greatest block of Old Testament predictive material. Isaiah ranks first in Old Testament messianic predictions. If you want to know about America, styled as Babylon, go to Jeremiah, the 50th through the 51st chapter, and you'll see the oracle against Babylon. And brothers and sisters, if anything you should look for, know the difference between the historical Jesus and the predicted Messiah and the Christ. Let's, let's close. This is our mission. Our mission is to give life to the dead. Because the dead give the living life and the living give dead life. There's a fair exchange between the two. Brother Eric was telling you, when we go among the people, the people just appreciate it. We don't put on any airs. We just come and we be with them. And whatever they're doing that's all right, we're trying to support them. And they're very appreciative of us being with them and supporting them in what they're trying to do. Bring about a healing. Stop the killing in the community, man. Cleaning up the arts and the culture so that it represents righteous rap. Salvation songs with liberation lyrics. Y'all ain't hearing me. 
fashion shows where people ain't got to get butt naked for the people to clap and applaud. But women of modesty, men of modesty, y'all ain't, uh, what? Huh? A good meal that you can have today. I wish y'all had smell of vision y'all could smell this food that's cooking up in here. Because when you go home, you can eat that food and you ain't got to worry about your, my, my pill. I got to take my pressure pill. Because we cook to live. Because we shop to live. And because the sisters are in the right spirit, don't nobody go back there and mess with them. Leave them alone. So that bean soup is in the right spirit. But our mission is to give life to the dead, brothers and sisters, to wake them up with this wake up message for them to stand up, to clean up, to straighten up, and then to move out on what they've learned. Don't sit up in here with what we teach you and do nothing. Don't go home and do nothing. Go do some good, and God will give you credit for the good that you do. We want you to join. We are encouraging you to join. We ask you to join, man, but we're not begging you to join. Because what we're doing is we're telling you the truth, and now that we told you the truth, your blood is not on our hands. You got to do something with the truth that you got. You can't sit at the table, eat at the table of Jesus, and then go in the garden and fall asleep. Yes, sir. Stay awake yes, sir. and pray with him in the garden. Yes, we in the garden now. He's about to be taken. And then will we deny him? Will we betray him? Will we abandon him? Or will we stand up like the followers of Garvey should have stood up? Will we stand up like the followers of Martin Luther King should have stood up? Will we stand up like the followers of Malcolm should have stood up? Will we stand up like the followers of Noble Drew Ali should have stood up? W.B. Du Bois should have stood up. Will we stand up in this hour or will we go to sleep? Will we deny or will we betray the one that's in our midst today? I'm talking about the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. So, you think it's just him? We're in the Farrakhan worship? You're out your mind. There's the historical Jesus. There's Master Fahd Muhammad, the coming of the Son of Man, found in Matthew, coming from the east to the west. Talk to me. There is the Jesus in our midst, the Honorable Minister Lord, uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who raised up like the prophet, like unto Moses. He is our Moses. Y'all ain't hearing me. Then you got the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Who is his enemies? Then you know that he's the Jesus in our midst. But don't, don't, don't get spooky. Who are you? Who are you? He come to make you a savior too. What are you saved for? Unless you're going to go out and save others. That's your purpose. You can't sit on that purpose. So, in Obadiah, it says, then saviors shall come to Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. God will be the king, but we will be those saviors sent by God to our people. A mountain or mountain stand for the high places our people believe they can take refuge in these, these institutions built by this world, but God has now carved a stone without hands that is now going around the earth, is filling up the earth, and is destroying everything in its path. It is hitting that image that the king of Babylon saw at its feet. And it's bringing that image down because there's a head of gold and all the rest. But at the bottom of it was mud, was iron mixed with miry clay. That's us. The poor of this world is catching hell right now. And upheaval has taken place all in Central and South America. That's why those people are coming here. Bolivia has ha is having trouble. All of these South American countries. Think about the Ten Crowns that's talked about in the book of Revelation. I can't go into all of it right now, Daniel in the book of Revelation. But these crowns, they grew to hate the woman, hate the beast, hate the whore. They hated them. South America is hating on America right now. Y'all ain't hearing me. They're pulling coup d'etats everywhere. And now, brother and sister, this thing is all coming to a head. As the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, that America and Russia would fight. Yes, Not the USSR, America and Russia would fight. And they're fighting right now. 
So as you watch this whole country, where's the other paper? This country right now, right now as I speak, is absolutely on edge. You may not watch these, in, these uh, uh, impeachment hearings, but what's happening right now is you're watching the implosion of America. We have to go and save our people. We have to go wake up our people, lest their blood be on our hands. Because when this Titanic hits the iceberg, there ain't but so many lifeboats. And if our people are down in third class, second class, and they close those bulkheads to keep that water that's coming in from the bottom from reaching up and filling up the ship, they will lock people down in those lower, those lower, uh, uh, lower levels to save the ship. That's where we are. So they will sacrifice us to save their nation. Right. And last point I make to you, watch how this thing unfolds in 2020. They're going to use the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam as a wedge issue in the Democratic Party. You hear me now? They're going to put, they're going to try to hang us and the minister around the Democrats' necks. And they're going to have to be forced to repudiate us. That's right. And when they lose the election and Donald Trump is reelected, yeah. right. they're going to blame us. Right. They're going to blame the minister. There goes the crucifixion. Right. Or it may go another way. I don't know how it's going to go down, but it may go another way. Donald Trump, what would you do to get out from underneath this? Since your buddy Netanyahu over there has been indicted for bribery right. and all that, what will, what will you do when the lobby, the Zionist lobby comes to Trump? So what will you do to get out of this? We can get you out of this, you know. We can get, a, we can get you out. We need you to do us a favor, though. No. Louis Farrakhan. You need to do something about him. Will we deny him? Will we betray him? Will we abandon him? Or will we stand up? Will we clean up? Will we straighten up? I believe you. I believe that this group will not deny the Messiah in our midst like we did the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I believe that these disciples are so wide awake, even though we got a little sleep now, we've we've wiped that sleep, at least one eye is open right now. And we see what's going on. We're trying to sound the alarm, my brothers and sisters, so that we don't have a third time that we die him because the third time is the charm. Yes, and we don't have to suffer unnecessary losses if we will but unite and do the things that we have to do. So, brothers and sisters, I want you to consider this. This is these six words. I know Stevie Wonder had three words. I love you, and, and, and that's true. But what I want you to do is to take these six words, accept your own, and be yourself. That is the greatest love that you can have is self-love. Because if you love yourself and know yourself, knowledge of self is akin to the knowledge of God. And when you know yourself, whom God created, when you love yourself, then you're qualified to love your neighbor. So I want you to love yourself, brothers and sisters, like you never did before. I want you to clean up. I want you to treat this, this body like it's the holy temple of God, more holy than any mosque, synagogue, cathedral, church that ever was, that what you put in here, you won't defile it, but it's not what goes in that defiles it, what comes out. And what comes out is based upon what you put in. If you're not putting in knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, then can nothing but filth and debauchery come out of you. But when you begin to put in the word of God and consciousness begins to raise, then what happens is your lyrics change. Your music changes. Your mind changes. Your language changes. And eventually your actions change. And then, brothers and sisters, then you're doing the work of God. Instead of having the mark of the beast in your forehead and in your hands, you'll have the mark of God in your forehead and in your hands. And you'll be doing the work of God because you'll be the instrument of God. And then you will not be one of those who deny the Messiah in your time. In fact, you'll be 
one of the messiahs sent by the messiah to go out and save his people. Thank you for listening. May Allah bless you as I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum. All praises due to Allah. Okay, my brothers, my sisters, please be seated. So always ask these questions and then uh, we will be dismissed. How many of you believe what you heard today? Well, first of all, how many of you visit with us for the first time? This is your first time ever being out to.